Our next guest is Andy Imperato. Mr. Imperato began work in February of 2020 as an executive director of Disability Rights California, otherwise known as DRC. After a high impact 26 year career in Washington, DC in disability advocacy and policy, DRC is the federally funded legal services agency that serves California with all types of disabilities across the age spectrum. Since joining D DRC, Imperato has led advocacy effort to protect California disability community from health and economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. He also helped shape Governor Newsom's master plan for aging as part of his administration stakeholder advisory committee and has worked to position California as a national leader on competitive integrated employment for people with disabilities. In February, he was appointed by President Biden to be one of the 12 public members of a federally COVID-19 health equity task force. While in DC, Imperato served as the disability policy director for Chairman Tom Parkin on the US Senate Committee on Health Education, Labor and Pension. Imperato grew up in Southern California received a BA in Humanities from Yale College in 1987 and is a 1990 graduate of Stanford Law School. His perspective is informed by his lived experience with bipolar disorder. He has received a number of honors and awards, including the 10 Outstanding Young Americans Award from the U.S. Junior Chamber of Commerce, the Henry Viscardi Achievement Award from Viscardi Center in New York, the Crowley National Advocacy Award and living. I mean, this gentleman has lived and very accomplished life. And he had received appointments to the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities from Governor Newsom. He was also appointed by U.S. Senator Tom Daschle to the Bipartisan Ticket to Work and Work Incentive Advisory Panel, where he helped develop new models for disabilities, benefits that did not create barriers to employment. Mr. Imperato, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much, Bobby, and it's great to be here with all of you. As you can tell from my bio, I'm new in California after 30 years on the East Coast. And I started a month before the pandemic. So it's been an interesting first year and a half for me. One of the things that we worked on that I'm uh, kind of the most personally proud of and um, hoping very relevant for this group is we, we hosted a virtual summit at the end of May called uh, Building Back Better for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And the, the focus of the summit was really, how can we create a better economy as we emerge from this pandemic that works better for people with all types of disabilities, including people who are also members of other minority groups who have disabilities. And um, we were delighted that Governor Newsom uh, made remarks at the summit, our new Senator United States Senator Padilla uh, spoke at the summit. Uh, we had Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Katie Porter speak. And then we had a number of state uh, agency heads, including Secretary Galli from Health and Human Services, uh, Nancy Bargeman from DDS, Joe Xavier, uh, Heather Calames from the Education Department. It, it was a nice cross section of folks from state government. And I, you know, I wanted to make sure you all know kind of what Governor Newsom said, because I think there may be an opportunity to kind of build on that and for this group to help us think about how to build on that. He, he said that he was proud of the fact that California was the birthplace of the disability rights movement and the independent living movement. He wanted California to have the most inclusive economy in the world. And he talked about how the state government should model that. 
and it should be we should be um, kind of the best state in terms of creating opportunities for people with disabilities to have careers in state government and play leadership roles in state government. So, you know, I know there's been efforts and people in this group have been part of efforts to try to get better data about what is happening in state service for people with disabilities, um, try to make various programs that are designed to make it easier for people with disabilities to enter state service, to get those programs to work well, to have paid internship programs that help create a pipeline for folks with intellectual and other types of disabilities to come into government service. Um, and you know, I think one of the, the things that's worth looking at um, is what happened at the end of the Obama administration related to federal service. Uh, there's a provision in the Federal Rehabilitation Act, um, Section 511, that has required the federal government to engage in affirmative action for state employment. Um, but it hasn't been enforced particularly well in the federal government. So at the end of the Obama administration, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, specifically under the leadership of Commissioner Heifeldblum, who had also been one of the folks who worked on the original Americans with Disabilities Act when she was working at the ACLU at the time, um, they really kind of strengthened the requirements so um, they specifically set a goal for employment for people with disabilities in federal service modeled on the ADA definition of disability, which is very broad. And then a, a sub goal for people with targeted disabilities, which is a term of art in the federal service, people with more significant disabilities. So the, the overall goal was 12%, the sub goal was 2%. Those goals, in my view, are pretty modest. I mean, the, the, the definition of disability in the ADA is very broad. So hitting 12% around that definition should not be difficult. But I feel like if we can get governments to set goals and then look at across government, who are meeting those goals, who aren't, and then what's the strategy to bring, bring folks up so everybody's meeting at least a minimum goal, that feels like a good a good part of a strategy for California to get better. You know, the federal government has a Schedule A hiring authority where people can hire people with targeted disabilities without going through the competitive hiring process. Um, there may be ways we can, you know, learn from that and try to model it. There are other, other there are other states that I think have. Um, engaged more aggressively to try to hire people with disabilities, including Washington State. Uh, when Jack Markell was the chair of the National Governors Association, uh, he, he was allowed to have an issue that was kind of his pet issue for the year that he was the chair, and he picked the topic of disability employment, including state, state government employment, but also kind of policy at the state level that could help lead to more people with disabilities in the labor force across the board. Um, and when he was doing that, a number of governors engaged uh, and it was bipartisan. There were certainly Republican and Democratic governors who got excited and interested in having the state be more of a model. So I know that you know, there are groups in California who have been working on this a long time. Ralph Black, who's on my board, uh, you know, has been very engaged in this. Um, Tony Sauer is also on my board. I know he's been engaged in it. Catherine Campisi. There's a number of folks who've been kind of pushing this issue for a while. So I'm I'm excited to work with all of you to think about okay, how do we take kind of the vision that the governor laid out, the commitment that I think he has at a personal level, and deal with whatever the structural barriers are in California, whether they're at Cal HR or other places to help us kind of really accelerate progress on this issue. So I'm gonna stop there because I, I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions, but I, I just wanted to put that out there for you all. Thank you, Andy. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, like Mr. Amparato said, it's open for questions. Please unmute yourself or post your question chat and uh, ask Mr. Imperato any questions you like. 
Mr. Imperato? Yeah, please just call me Andy. Andy, yes. hello, my name is Christine. Um, you talked about the targeted disabilities and that was more on the federal level. Yeah. And then in Washington state, can you tell me the, the status of that within California? So, you know, th there are people on this call that know a lot more about kind of the hi California's history around trying to bring people with disabilities into state government service. My understanding is we don't have a targeted disability category but we do have kind of special initiatives in California, like around internships for people with intellectual disabilities. And I think the State Council on Developmental Disabilities has been involved with that. I know Governor Newsom made an announcement around that last year. Um, my understanding is we don't really have the same kind of a targeted disability concept at the state level, but it, is there anybody on the call who kind of can is familiar with the federal approach and the state approach and the differences? There's another question I saw came up in the chat. Can you say more about the Schedule A authority for more flexibility in the hiring process? Where can I read about that? Yeah, so um, if that program is run out of the Office of Personnel Management at the federal level, so I'm going to I'll find a website that describes it and post it in the chat, but it, it's it's kind of owned by the Office of Personnel Management. And then um, there are Schedule A kind of hiring authority um, officials spread out across the federal government so that, so that each cabinet level agency has somebody in their agency who's who runs the program and is supposed to be able to answer questions around it. Um, again, under the Obama administration, there was a real effort to make that program work better. And, it, and actually, some of this started under the Bush administration when, when Christine Griffin was the equal at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She really took on trying to make Schedule A hiring authority work better, have it be used more. But it's a non-competitive process to bring people with significant disabilities into federal service. And, you know, the advantage for people that are doing the hiring is they can hire people a lot more quickly and people can get certified that they meet the level of severity requirements for Schedule A. And um, once they're certified, anybody in the federal government can hire them through a non-competitive process. And then they can, after they're there for a couple of years, they can be converted um, and then I'm just noted, noting in the chat that this concept of targeted or more significant disabilities is not something that we have in the state of California right now. Um, thank you, Glenna from CalHR for posting that. Anyway, I'll, I will post in the chat the website where you can learn more about the Schedule A hiring authority. Hey, Andy, I'm uh, Matthew Swiss-Gable. I work at Department of Managed Healthcare Services as an OA. I've been here since the beginning of March, and I'm the chairperson of the um, DAC for um, our site. Um, I actually am a uh, person, an employee who was part of that initiative, who was appointed by the governor, and I've actually been qualified for being in a position uh, for a little over a year before that had happened. I'd been working with DOR to try and get positions. I noticed you mentioned this initiative is trying to kind of bypass the regular application. Um, personally, one of the things that I found frustrating is the number of job coaches, developers, you know, people within the source that when I was trying to get this set up, trying to get a job with the state before this program happened uh, that they would tell me don't get your hopes up i've seen so many people trying and they can't get it that leap certification is actually going to be a negative to you because it's going to identify you as a dis uh, disabled person and it's going to make it harder for you to get uh actually employed with the state and so i know with the dac in general this is part of that point is to help break down those negative connotations help kind of educate and all of that but my question is is there going to be any kind of effort in addition to the um, kinds of programs we're seeing now that the governor is pushing to kind of have people bypass that process, but also to try and work on that process and make it more easy for people with disabilities to just get jobs going through the regular application. Yeah, I mean, so I, that's why I, I think it's helpful to start with Governor Newsom's vision. Right? If his vision 
is that we should be the best state in the country in terms of creating opportunities for people with disabilities to serve at all levels of state government, then we need to kind of put some meat on the bones of that vision. Let's look at the trend lines, what's been happening for state service for people with disabilities, um, what happened during the pandemic. You know, if you look at California data overall, labor force participation rates, a lot of people with disabilities who were in the labor force at the beginning of the pandemic were knocked out of the labor force and have not come back. So it, I, I haven't seen an analysis of the impact of the pandemic on state employment for people with disabilities um, and, and also kind of people with disabilities who are in other intersectional uh, disadvantaged groups. But that, to me, that would be an important thing. You know, I, I just we just had the first meeting of our implementation group for the master plan for aging. And one of the things that, that they're using at the California Department of Aging is a data dashboard where they're, they're trying to look at trends, trying to update the data and have the ability to drill down in lots of different ways. Well, it would be great to have that kind of a data dashboard for what's happening in state employment for people with disabilities where you could kind of break it down by agency, break it down by types of jobs, break it down by geographies. Um, so again, I mean, I feel like the governor laid out the vision. Now it's up to those of us who are passionate about this to, to kind of spell out how to achieve that vision. Um, and I, you know, I, certainly there are state agencies like the Department of Rehabilitation that have done a lot to create opportunities for people with disabilities when they're within their agency. I think it's important that we learn what's worked for them. Is there a way to get that applied much more broadly across state service? Yeah, thank you. As somebody who both has gone through this process and also been, you know, a job coach for other people with disabilities, work with job development for other people and stuff like this, one of the things that would be a benefit of being able to just apply through it is to keep the the aspect of their disability as minimal in the job as possible. It is really nice to be able to get these opportunities uh, presented to you, but the fact that it happens because of the disability also to a lot of people can feel a little self-conscious and demeaning. Um, I understand that it is to help prevent the prejudice and to give these opportunities right now. But at the same time, um, a lot of people feel discouraged about that because then they're identified as having a disability and it becomes a big part of the work itself, uh, of their role at the work. So being able to just apply and be hired based on just the um, capabilities to do the job is an important aspect for a lot of people with disabilities looking for jobs. Yeah, no, I appreciate that perspective. I guess, you know, as, as was mentioned by Bobby in my introduction, you know, I have lived experience with bipolar disorder myself. And I don't necessarily think that my bipolar disorder makes me better at, you know, being an executive director. But I do think that it connects me to the mission of the organization in a deeper way, and I'm able to draw from my lived experience in my advocacy. So I think there are some state jobs where the lived experience is going to be critically important and connect to the mission of the state agency. There are other jobs where it may not at first glance seem to matter that much, but I guess in my experience, you know, whether you have lived experience as a person with a disability or as a first generation college graduate or somebody coming from a rural part of the state or coming from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, all of those lived experiences can add value to the to the state workforce. We want to we want a workforce that looks like the state and that can provide informed quality services to everybody in the state. So I, I feel like there's an aspect of anybody's lived experience with a disability that should be a positive differentiator when they're applying for a job. So I guess that's where I feel like we need to go. I recognize we're not necessarily there yet. And a lot of people still experience discrimination and barriers and don't want to be pigeonholed as the kind of the disability hire. But I, I just want us to push back against that and really try to frame our lived experience as positive and as making the state better. Andy, I don't want to lose some, I'm so sorry. Uh, did you finish your question? Say thank you, I appreciate it. 
Andy, I don't want to lose. We've got a lot of people in the comments that are asking questions, and I want to make sure we get some of these covered. Um, we did have some uh, earlier about, can you say more about Schedule A authority for more flexibility in the hiring process? Where can I read about that? And another one was, can you talk about the difference between Schedule A and the Cali, the K, CA Elite program? We'll go with those, and then I'll get to the other ones. Yeah, so I posted two links in the chat where you can learn a lot more about the Schedule A hiring authority. And I'm sure there are people on this call who can post links where people can learn more about the California LEAP program. The, the Probably the most user-friendly link is the one from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's called ABC Schedule. Uh, well, it's basically the ABCs of the Schedule A hiring authority. Um, and it's, it's written in you know, relatively plain language. So I think it'll give you a good sense of how it works at the federal level. I don't mean to say that the Schedule A hiring authority is the end all and be all. I think we have to try a lot of different things and figure out what's going to work best in California. I've heard some people argue that under our state constitution, we can't do exactly what the feds are doing. I'd love to see more of an analysis of that. But the bottom line is if we're serious about bringing more people with disabilities into state service, we'll find a way to do it that's effective. And our state government is big enough that there are models out there that are working that we can learn from and try to benefit from. And Andy, I don't know if you already saw this question. Can you talk about your efforts to increase employment of people with disabilities and specifically targeted disabilities in university systems as the director of AUCD? Yeah, so um, my job immediately before coming to Disability Rights California, I was running a national membership organization called the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. And we there are three centers in California, one at UCLA, one at USC, one at UC Davis. Um, and these are federally funded university centers for excellence in developmental disabilities. We developed two strategic plans during my six-year tenure at AUCD, and both plans had a goal of our network writ large champion and modeling diversity, equity, and inclusion. And part of that was, was getting more intentional about cultivating people with lived experience with disabilities for leadership roles within the university centers. That, that was very, when I got to AUCD, it was pretty uneven. Some centers were doing really well, like the center uh, in Hawaii had a number of folks with lived experience with disabilities working for them. Um, other centers, it just hadn't been a priority. So we tried to kind of push that. And I was very proud of the fact that our board had way more participation from people with disabilities when I left AUCD than it had when I started. And in order to get on that board, you had to run, you had to be elected by the directors. So I took that as a sign that they were embracing the importance of having people with lived experience in leadership roles. The president of the board when I left uh, AUCD was a blind person of color who had a leadership role at our center in Utah. And I think it was the first time we'd had a person of color with a disability as our board president. Um, another question, which is very close to my heart, Joyce asks, is one of the barriers the reluctance to do job creation or to modify existing job duty statements? How would we overcome that barrier? Or who is already working on that? Who is a resource to this? And I say this is close to my heart because this nine times out of 10 is the very first thing I ask is in, in each of our agencies, who can we talk to about what you put at the back of the duty statement? If it says, you know, you're sitting in an office job, but then, you know, 10% of the time you need to lift a box. It's like, if all I'm doing is sitting at the computer, why do I have to 10% of the time lift a box? And if you're someone who literally can't lift a box, that would be a reason why I know I wouldn't apply for that job. So this is a good question, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I, would, I would point to that as a, an example of a structural barrier to people with disabilities being successful in a competitive process and being successful in terms of advancing their careers. Um, I think that the state can learn a lot from the private sector in terms of job carving, um, you know, tailoring the job to people's uh, skills and capacity and being thoughtful about kind of how to get the most productivity out of your workforce overall. I think 
one of the, the mistakes that a lot of managers make, not, not just in state employment, but in general, is they kind of look at somebody's performance up against their job description and they kind of you know, point out the areas where the performance is not meeting the requirements in the job description. But a lot of managers fail to ask the question, is there something this person is extraordinarily good at? Is there a way to structure their job so they're spending more time doing the things that they're extraordinarily good at and that are going to advance our mission? And are there ways to have other people do things that they're not as good at when those other people may be extraordinarily good at those things? So I, I think that approach to management, where you're really trying to leverage individual strength, works well for people with disabilities, but I think it works well to build high-functioning teams whether you have people with disabilities on the team or not. So again, to me, it's an analysis. I know we have folks from Cal HR here. It's an analysis, what are, what are the structural barriers that are getting in the way in California? And again, I would start with asking, are there agencies that have figured out ways around these barriers that other agencies could learn from? I'm going to jump in. Uh, we don't have any more in the chat, but I, I actually had a question um, as the moderator and technical support here. Um, I really care about those of us who are disabled, who have um, fought through the system. We got a job. We've been keeping on to our job because, you know, if we don't have our job, then paying, we need our insurance. You know, we're, we're struggling every day, but we're making it work and how to keep that job because it's, um, there's a lot of always discussion about getting the job, that that's the first step. Um, and then those of us in the community that have gotten the job and have sacrificed as much as we can to keep that job. Um, there's, it feels to me like there's, um, not as many avenues that support the keeping the job as much as they're getting the job. And one of my, uh, I recently read an article that I saw that said, um, uh, what is it, 66, 63% of EEOC complaints um, for last year's numbers um, were said to eventually lose that job, that like it's hard keeping a job once you put in a complaint about I have a concern. Um, is that a concept that, that comes up for you guys? You know, like how do we help our um, staff that they've, they've fought the good fight, they got the job, they've been fighting to keep the job, and yet they're still struggling because the system isn't, isn't really built to support. If anything, it's built to weed us out. Do um, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think it's a critical point, and I, I know we're running to the end of my time. I put my email address and my my Twitter feed in the chat. The nice thing about my Twitter feed is you don't have to spell my last name <laughs> to find me on Twitter. But, um, you know, I'll just say in response to the, the really important point about retention, uh, in 2010, when we were celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, President Obama announced a goal to hire 100,000 new federal workers uh, with disabilities uh, within the next five years. And the good news is that they did meet that goal. The federal government under Obama turned out to be a two-term presidency where he was there for the whole five years. They did, they did meet that goal, but a lot of the people they hired ended up leaving after a couple of years. So um, it's, it's, it's a critically important point. And this is where I think it's helpful to have mentoring programs, to have employee resource groups where employees can come together and provide peer support for each other, to have kind of interventions to help people that are struggling so that they don't end up um, leaving, or to reassign them to other positions that might be a better fit for their skill set or their interests. But it, it is very important. If, if California is going to be a leader, the leader in the country, we have to look not just at labor force participation rates but at retention, promotion, advancement. Um, and, and if we're not looking at that, we're going to miss problems. Andy, uh, thank you very much. And I really appreciate you spending the time with us. There's a lot more questions uh, that come up relating to this topic. And you have been terrific in answering many of the issues that confront us within this community. So. Thank you once again for being an outstanding guest. 
Thank you. It's my pleasure. I look forward to coming back. And I, I hope some of you will follow up with me because I'm really interested in your ideas of things that we could be promoting with the state government. Excellent. We will be inviting you back, Andy. We'll take you up on that offer. Sounds good. Thanks. Have a great day. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye.